This is a Ford Bronco. And it isn't the new Ford Bronco that Ford's been promising us they're going to revive for like a decade now. Instead, this is the old school Bronco, the original, with a big old V8 and body on frame construction. And this is the end of the line, as this is a 1996 model, which was the Bronco's last year. And today, I'm going to review it. I've borrowed this Bronco from a viewer here in San Diego, and before I get into reviewing this one, let's go over a little bit of Bronco history. Now, the Bronco first came out in 1965, and everybody knows that original version. It's starting to become collectible and rather valuable. The second generation Bronco came out in the late 1970s, and it was a little bit larger, intending to compete with other full-size SUVs at the time, like the Chevy Blazer and the Dodge Ram Charger. After that, Ford updated the full-size Bronco over the years, and the last generation was sold from 1992 to 1996. So this is the final year of the final Bronco. Obviously, the Bronco's most memorable moment came on June 17, 1994, when football star O.J. Simpson led police on a chase through Los Angeles in a white 1993 Bronco with his friend Al Cowlings at the wheel after O.J. had been accused of murdering his wife. Interestingly, despite the notoriety from that police chase, the Bronco didn't last very long after that. In 1995, Chevy came out with a four-door version of its two-door full-size blazer called the Chevy Tahoe. SUV mania was just beginning, and Ford realized they needed a four-door big SUV to compete since the Bronco was always a two-door. So the Bronco went away, and instead Ford came out with the Expedition, which sold in big numbers. Now, the last Broncos were offered with a choice of two different V8s. You could get a 5-liter V8 or a 5.8-liter V8. This one has the 5.8, which makes 210 horsepower and 328 pound-feet of torque. So today I'm going to review this Bronco, and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features of Ford's very last old-school SUV. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Bronco, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of the best preserved old SUVs currently listed for sale on Autotrader. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Bronco by demonstrating how you get into the cargo area, which is very much proof of its old school SUV status. You start with the tire cover. There's a little latch on the tire cover. You push it and then you kind of push the tire cover out of the way. So now you're here and you look at the tailgate and you don't see a latch to open it up. So how do you get back here? Well, it's actually a rather complicated process. You take the key and you stick it in this little keyhole over on the left. You twist it to the right and then the window goes down automatically. Now, once that has happened, then you can reach inside and pull down the tailgate and that is how you get into the cargo area of a 96 Ford Bronco. This is insane by modern standards. Modern car, you walk up to the back of it, you swipe your foot under the bumper, and the tailgate opens automatically. In this vehicle, it is a three-step process, and it takes like 15 seconds just to throw something into the cargo area. It's crazy. Now, once you gain access to the cargo area, you look back here and you can see there isn't anything noteworthy or special. It's pretty much just a cargo area, but there is something special about the tailgate, and that's the fact that it folds down like this, and that means you can sit on it if you want. You can have a picnic out the back of your Bronco. You can tailgate for a sporting event. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. And unlike pickup truck tailgates, which are just metal, Ford knew people were going to do this, so they carpeted the tailgate so you can just sit here and hang out out the back of your Bronco on the beach at a drive-in movie, whatever it is you want to do. But maybe the most interesting thing about the whole cargo area accessing procedure is that when you go to close the tailgate, you don't lock it. Because think about it, when you close the tailgate, the only way that someone could possibly get back in is if they could reach in and grab the latch. So instead of locking your tailgate, you put the key back in, you twist it the other direction, and the window goes back up, thus preventing someone from being able to access the latch to open the tailgate. So in your car, you lock your tailgate to prevent people from stealing your valuables. If you had a 96 Bronco, you just put up your window 
and it has the same effect. Now, next up, moving down the side of the Bronco, one interesting item with this car is the fact that this whole area back here is not part of the body of the car. If you actually look closely, you can see that the body, the metal, ends like above the front seats in the front next to the doors, and then this is a different piece. It's like a plastic, and it's actually stuck on here. So the body of the Bronco looks like a pickup truck, and it kind of goes down after the front seats, but they stick this on in the back, and in theory, you could remove it. It isn't designed to be removed easily like you're in a Jeep or something, but if you go into the interior, you can see where this rear top bit is attached, fastened to the rest of the Bronco, and if you want, you could remove it. But it is tremendously heavy. Again, not designed to be removed. It has windows in it. It's one big piece, and so it's kind of a commitment. You basically remove it or you don't, but it's not something you're going to want to do frequently. Now, next up around the back of the Bronco, I love how the bumper comes to an end back here. Modern cars, the bumpers are so perfectly integrated into the fluid lines of the car, and they make sure to make it a piece of style and design, not just a safety component. In this thing, it just stops. <laughs> it's bumper, and then it isn't bumper anymore, and you can see it sticks out like an inch from the body. There's this giant gap here. This would never fly today in any modern car design, but this is how you did it in the old school. You just kind of tacked on a big chrome bumper, and that was that. You didn't pay much attention to how it looked or whether you could integrate it into the styling philosophy of the car, like so many vehicles today. Now, next up, I want to move on to the wheels, because the wheel design of this vehicle is actually rather unusual, and I say that because the theme is circles, and I mean circles. Okay, you have a circle in the center, most wheels do, and then you have the lug nuts around the center. Those are also circles, pretty standard, but it goes from there. Around the lug nuts, you have these little screws that go in, also circles. Then around that whole assembly, you have a bunch of different holes those are circles. And then the whole thing is rimmed by these silver rivet looking things, which of course are also circles. And then obviously the wheel itself is a circle and there's a circle inside that too. I counted the circles on this wheel and I got to 44. If you include the wheel itself and the valve stem, this is a very circular themed wheel design. Now, next up, we move on to the interior of the 96 Bronco, where there are a surprising number of quirks and features, despite the fact that it's relatively simple in here. I want to start with the door panel. Now, this door panel was simply bad. It was just crappy plastic. Ford put it in everything. We had a 96 Explorer Sport with this door panel when I was growing up. It just has big panel gaps you can see everywhere and a lot of cheap plastic, but in this vehicle, Ford decided to class things up a bit. You see the upper area? Well, that's a nice padded surface. It isn't leather. We couldn't go that far, but it's similar to leather. Nice and padded, good to touch. And Ford felt that would do the trick at changing this door panel into a nice, luxurious one. Now, speaking of the doors, the doors in this old Bronco contain one of my very favorite automotive features, and that would be front quarter windows. There's this little latch on the window, and if you twist it, you can then push open the front quarter window, and you can move it around to direct air where you want it. Obviously, you can run the air conditioning in this car, but if you're driving down the road with that quarter window open, it can blow air right on you, and it feels almost better than air conditioning, even on a hot day. I love those quarter windows. Nobody does them anymore, and I wish some Someone would bring them back. Now, next up, climbing in, one of the first things you notice is that on the side of the front seats, there is a little switch that says plus or minus. This is the lumbar adjustment. Not all that unusual, but the thing I love about it is the noise that it makes. Take a listen. It's just so excessive. Does it really need to make that much noise? No modern car would have its lumbar adjustment make that much noise, but they could get away with it back then. And speaking of things they could get away with back then, it is amazing to me that this passed for a normal car interior just 20 years ago. For example, in your car, in the center control stack, you have buttons, you have maybe a screen. In this car, you have carpeting for the vast majority of it. They just didn't stick anything there. It wasn't worth the time and money to design something to fit there, so you just have this giant open hole between the dashboard and the center console where there's nothing. And speaking of the center console, it also is just incredibly cheap, old school. It's just this plastic component, two cup holders in the front. The middle part, obviously, is storage. And that's it. They just bolt it down. It isn't just one big, flowing, beautiful piece like modern car interiors. It's just this 
piece of plastic stuck between the seats, and that was that. Another old school item I love in this interior is the steering wheel. Ford used this steering wheel in everything in the mid 90s. The thing I love about it is the fact that they put an airbag in this steering wheel and they couldn't seem to figure out how to make the airbag and the horn be in the same place. So the airbag is in the middle and the horn is confined to these little thumb buttons on the side. Now this was common for a lot of automakers in the 90s, but I've always found it funny. Cars now obviously have the airbag and the horn as one panel and you press the center and that's the horn. But for a period there, nobody seemed to be able to figure it out. So you had these little horn thumb buttons. And speaking of the steering wheel, I really like the fact that the cruise control buttons are on the steering wheel and they take up both sides. You have on off over on the left, take up the entire left side of the buttons. And over on the right, you have the rest of the cruise control buttons. Ford had this great idea to integrate buttons into the steering wheel, but stereo volume, no. Fan speed for the climate control, no, no. Instead, make all of the space used by five cruise control buttons. It was a different era. Maybe the best example of how old school this interior is though, is how stuff is just kind of randomly placed in the interior. For example, on the dashboard to the right of the gauge cluster, you have the four x four and low range buttons just kind of hanging out there by themselves to the left of a little light, which I guess is maybe the alarm. <laughs> Not sure how those two go together, but they're placed together. I also mentioned the horn thumb buttons, which are kind of randomly placed on the steering wheel. And then over to the left of the gauge cluster, you have a little switch that will allow you to raise or lower the rear window and back. It's power operating in the back, as I showed you a minute ago. And just like in Forerunners, you can put it down with a little switch in the front. But only you, the driver, can put it down because they put the switch to the left of the gauge cluster. The passengers do not have access. If the passengers want the rear window down, they will simply have to ask nicely. I also like the fact that integrated into this dashboard in the bottom near the steering wheel, there is just this little hole. I guess it's a little storage cubby. Of course, if you put anything in there, you can accelerate hard. It's going to fly out. But I guess Ford figured, hey, we got extra room. Uh, let's make a hole. Now above that hole is probably the most randomly placed item in the entire dashboard, and that would be the rear defroster button, which for some reason just hangs out in no man's land next to one of the central climate vents, not anywhere near the climate controls. You have all of those in the middle, and then rear defroster has its own button elsewhere, which is an unusual placement, but it didn't seem really like they cared all that much about style and continuity of placement of buttons in the interior of this car. Now next up, a couple of interesting labels in this interior. One is the cigarette style power outlet. It doesn't say power outlet, instead it says power point. And when I see that, I just can't help but think of Microsoft and slide presentations in office meetings. The other interesting label is in the gauge cluster itself for battery voltage, oil pressure, and engine temperature. Instead of having a little area that's in the normal range, it actually says normal on it. And so when you look at the gauges, if they're on the normal, then you're fine. How many arguments do you think happened? Don't you think we should check it out? No, no, it's at the L. It's at the L in normal. We're still good. It's not unnormal yet. It's still just on that L. We're fine. Don't have to check anything. Now, next up, we move on to the glove box and the owner's manual. Now, I leafed through the owner's manual, but the only thing that I found interesting with it is that it's in this little blue pouch that says Ford Bronco, which I really like. If I had a Bronco like this, I think I would simply remove the owner's manual from this pouch and stick in like a calendar organizer thing, and then I would look really cool every time I pulled out my planner to write an appointment. Now, next up, time to climb into the back seats of the Bronco. And the process of climbing into the back seats has actually a little bit of a quirk in itself. It starts normally enough. You pull this little latch on the front seat and the front seat folds forward, pretty simple. Then you move it forward along a track and it gets to this point. Then that track moves forward on another track which is very unusual. You have a seat rail on top of a seat rail and the whole thing moves forward. And when it does that, there's actually a pretty good amount of room to just climb back in here. It's not as good as having four doors, obviously, but it's really not all that bad. It's surprisingly easy. 
to get in and out of the Bronco. Now, once you get into the back seat, you will find that it's a fairly standard bench seat with seating for three people. There's three separate seat belts back here, so the Bronco can seat five in total. And you'll also notice a couple of other interesting things back here. One is that there are individual ashtrays on the left and right sides of the rear seat. So two separate rear passengers can be smoking away as they're being driven along, but the rear windows do not roll down. Because of this top situation that I mentioned earlier, and this being a piece that's separate from the body, these windows can't roll into the body itself. So if you're sitting in the rear seats, you don't have access to roll down a window, which is something you have to think of if you're gonna start smoking. You only have access to those ashtrays. Now, the other interesting thing you have in the rear seats is individual cup holders. Again, there's one on the left and one on the right sides of the rear seats. So rear seat passengers have their own cup holders. Obviously, this is now pretty common in family SUVs, but it wasn't back when this was a new car. That is a nice luxury for rear seat passengers. And finally, we move around to the front of the Bronco and the engine, the big 5.8 liter V8 that made 210 horsepower. The most amazing thing about that to me is the fact that there was a smaller engine, a 5 liter V8, and in 96, that engine made 205 horsepower. So the difference was really negligible, although it's worth noting that the bigger V8 did have more torque, 325 pound-feet versus 275 pound-feet. So there's a difference of about 50 pound-feet. But of course, neither engine was really going to turn the Bronco into a sports car, and both engines, when it came to fuel economy and power output, were surprisingly in about the same league. Now, another thing I like under here is this lamp that turns on when you open the hood. This is a Ford OEM part that's stuck under here, but it just looks so ridiculously amateur. It looks like the kind of thing you would hang in a cave when you were going exploring in a dark cave. They just kind of stick this here and say, well, we're done. That's all the illumination you need. No automaker today would do that and not integrate it in some better and more seamless way. But I really like that. It looks old school. I also like on top of the engine, it says Ford 5.8 EFI for electronic fuel injection. I love the font it uses. It wasn't trying to be old fashioned, I suspect, but it looks that way now. And it has a very nice charm to it, if you ask me. And so those are the quirks and features of the 1996 Ford Bronco. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Bronco. Now, the first thing you notice when you drive this is it feels big, uh, but that's interesting because it isn't. This is only 183 inches long, um, which is shorter than like a Camry, but it feels large for a few reasons. Number one, you have that huge powertrain and you can hear it and it sounds like a big engine. Uh, another reason is the steering. I mean, it just it's very loose, it, it, it's very soft, it feels like a big car. When you go around a corner, you get that body roll. Um, also, it's very wide, and so in that sense, it is very large. Um, and then it just sort of is a lumbering, big, kind of slow vehicle. But despite all that, it's, you, it's, a, it's a relatively small car. I mean, I, 183 inches is the length of the new Civic. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't actually have that big of a footprint, but it certainly seems big. Obviously, I love the driving position in this thing. I mean, that was one of the, the big benefits of sort of old school SUVs, just how much you sat up and how much you were in a real, you know, truck basically that had just put a cap on the back and suddenly it's an SUV. It was a totally different way of doing it. Now, I've kind of called this sort of the, the last old school SUV. It's worth noting that Chevy did sell a two-door Tahoe K5 Blazer effectively through, I think, 98, 99. But I always felt that by then, that had been sort of modernized more for the consumer market. This really does feel like an old truck you go hunting, go into the woods, that sort of thing. And it, it felt like that longer than any other big SUV uh, through 96. All right, I'm flooring it here, getting on the highway. It's not as slow as I thought it would be, given its gigantic size. And it's got a lot of torque, even by modern standards. 325 pound-feet is pretty good. But it isn't fast. Put your foot down on the highway. I mean, it does what it needs to do. It's quicker than my Defender. It feels more rational, well put together than my Defender, but that's not saying a lot. The drive is basically exactly what you'd expect. There's a lot of play in the steering. You can go a couple inches in either direction before much happens. But that was typical of the time, of SUVs and trucks of the era. Not all that unusual. Um, you do feel like sort of the king of the road in this. I'm passing a new Jeep Cherokee crossover version of it. You're so much taller and bigger and more serious guy than someone in a 
you know, on a Cherokee or an MDX or whatever. You really do feel like you're driving a bastion of the old era. The act of knowing that you're kind of driving what has become a classic is kind of fun. It's interesting because when I was a kid, these were just common cars. People had them. You could rent them. I mean, Hertz had them. But now it's kind of becoming like a more of a vintage car, especially one like this with this dark red over silver. Uh, it's a cool, this is a very cool one, and it's in really nice shape. This one has 128,000 miles. The current owners told me they bought it 10 years ago with like 13,000 miles, and they've been, uh, they've been basically driving it daily uh, and using it as an actual vehicle. I told them to stop. I said the values are gonna go up. And so that's the 1996 Ford Bronco. This thing isn't fast, it isn't particularly efficient, it's not really luxurious, and in spite of the fact that the EPA rated this massive SUV at 12 miles per gallon city and 16 miles per gallon highway, it's not really all that useful for carrying people since it only has two doors. But the Bronco is still cool because it was the last traditional old school body on frame V8 two door SUV before the world fell in love with crossovers. And now it's time to give the Bronco a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Bronco is fine, nothing special, and it gets a five out of 10. Acceleration is slow, and it gets a one out of 10. Handling, of course, same deal, it's lazy and vague, and it gets a two out of 10. Fun factor is low, ultimately it's a big lumbering SUV and not some exciting sports car, and it gets a two out of 10. Finally, cool factor, and these are getting up there, though not excessively cool just yet, and it gets a four out of 10 for a total weekend score of 14 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It doesn't have much, and it gets a two out of 10. Comfort is good, you have a lot of interior room and the ride isn't too harsh, but it's still pretty rough and it gets a 5 out of 10. Quality is average, it's pretty reliable, but the interior is mediocre and it gets a 5 out of 10. Practicality is also average, you have a lot of cargo space, but rear seat access is a challenge and fuel economy is abysmal and it gets a 5 out of 10. Finally, value, and here this shines. These are getting cooler and they're shockingly cheap for what they are, as you can get nice ones for 10 grand or less. It gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 24 out of 50. Added up and the Doug score is 38 out of 100, which places it here against some other old school SUVs. No surprise the Bronco doesn't beat out the Hummer H1 Alpha or the Lamborghini LM002, but at least the Bronco beats out the Hummer H2. Most vehicles do. 